Dear Father, we are thankful for this record, uh, this unique record in all of history, where you have seen it fit to record what you have done on this earth when uh, most of these have been lost through the annals of time. So we do thank you for this wonderful gift that you have given us. We pray for uh, wisdom and perseverance as we uh, trog through this section of scripture. Uh, we pray that you will guide our hearts and guide our minds to see the spiritual importance of it. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, you may all be seated. You might be wondering what Paul did to me this week that I made him uh, read all those names. Just you wait. That's just 14 names. There are 26 names listed under Shem and 30 under Ham, so the uh, best is yet to come. All right. Our main point this morning is going to be similar to what we did last week and the week before, but we are now diving into the details. Our main point is that God has providentially preserved mankind, and he has done this by spreading humanity across the globe. And so we do finally move from our sermon series five, asking the question, has God forgotten us? With the resounding answer, no, by no means and under no circumstances has he forgotten us. And we will see in the coming weeks that he has not forgotten any of us. It is not just the nation of Israel, though the nation of Israel becomes his, his uh, crown jewel on this earth. There is not one person who has been born on this earth who has been forgotten by God. But we move into our next section, Sermon Series 6, Genesis 10, verse 1 through eleven twenty six, taking us almost to the end of chapter 11, asking this wonderful question, who can save us? Of course, we all know the answer to who can save us, but this would be a question lingering on the minds of those who just came out of the flood. Who is going to be the one who fulfills that promise that was given to Adam? Lamech thought it was Noah, and it was not Noah. We see that from Noah's sin. We looked at two weeks ago. The Savior can't be sinful like Adam was. And so this question is going to be perhaps forefront on the minds of those who are awaiting this coming seed. Who can save us? In this section, we also move finally from the Toledot of Noah, the record of his generations that we began way back, I think, in March. So it has been quite a while we've been in this Toledot of Noah, and we don't move very far. We move to the Toledot of Noah's sons. So this is our next uh, six weeks or so. We are going to look at the records of Noah's sons before we jettison off into the creation of Israel. So we start with verse 1, which is sort of a preamble to these records of Noah's sons. These are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah. The son, or, and sons were born to them after the flood. There were no more sons born to Noah. These were his only three sons. But his sons began to populate the earth once the flood had ended and once they were back into the new world. And there is a consistent pattern in these records of Noah's three sons. First, we see which line uh, Moses is speaking about. Then we get a, an extensive list of names with very few notes. Uh, mostly, it's just the names and the relationships. Of course, when there is a note, we want to pay special attention to that. And then there is a designation of the lands which they went to. So that is uh, going to be, I hope, not monotonous, but it will be detailed this morning. We start then with the line, but again, we need to fill in a bit of background material. What exactly was this post-Diluvian world like? The world after the flood had undergone plenty of changes. And in Genesis 8.22, we're promised many different kinds of cycles. The cycles of day and night would continue. The cycles of summer and winter would continue. But also these cycles of cold and heat. The world was entering into a cycle of cold. And it was going to last about a thousand years. 
This would divinely provide the opportunity for man to spread over the entire globe before it was once again isolated and God had protected nations on uh, diverse continents. So remember, the effects of the flood would have necessarily created an ice age. When you superheat these oceans with volcanic activity, sending ash and toxins up into the atmosphere, and then you send them over cold continents, it's going to snow. It's going to build up ice. It's going to get very cold because the sun will have been blocked out. Anything but an ice age after the flood would be inconsistent with all that science teaches us. And it would also be inconsistent with the movements of man that we see in the hundreds of years after the flood. And so we want to remember that as we look at all of these names, the world is getting colder, ice is growing, and people are going to be mostly wanting to head south, I would imagine. But Japheth's children, interestingly enough, head north. And a lot of them will cross this this land bridge over to Alaska and end up becoming the indigenous peoples of America. I know some will say that that's Ham or Shem, but I do think that was Japheth's line. Now there's a bit of a misconception as well, perhaps uh, mostly the fault of bad pictures that have been drawn of Noah's three sons, where they make one white, one black, and one brown. Now I have a brother, we're both the same color, and I think that was probably the same with Noah's children. They probably looked the same. And in all three of them was the propensity for all of the genes that we see on earth today. And it just depended on where they went and where those generations after generations after generations got isolated. The sons of Ham have traditionally been called the black races. But when the Egyptians drew pictures of the Phoenicians who were Hamites, they were whiter than most of the Shemites. The races don't come from these three different sons. The races come from isolated people groups and continued and multiplied bottlenecks in our genes. But this all comes as a result of God's command. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. We see them doing that in this chapter. Chapter 10 is a record of faithfulness and dispersion. But we don't understand until we get to chapter 11 that it's also a record of judgment because man had been unfaithful at Babel. They had not spread out across the entire world. They came under one government. And so chapter 10 is the record of the dispersion that happens after Babel. And then we're going to go back and get that information filled in. Also remember... It's the Ice Age. Babylon's pretty cold. All right, so here is our structure then. We want to remember that all of this comes on the heels of a covenant that God made with Noah. He promised him continuation on this earth, that this earth would not pass away, at least not by water, until God had fulfilled his promises to Noah and his purposes. Uh, in this civilization. And at the end of chapter 9, Noah gives a prophecy about his three sons. Chapter 10 is the fulfillment, both of that prophecy and God's command, God's stipulation to man in the Noahic covenant, to go out and fill the ends of the earth. We start with Japheth, the oft-forgotten middle child. We move on to Ham, the youngest of the brothers. And then we will end chapter 10 with Shem. He was the oldest brother, but he is also the most important brother for scripture because it is his line through which the Messiah will come. It is his line through whom the Jewish people will come who will bring about the Messiah. Chapter 11 is included so that we can understand why chapter 10 happened at all. They are out of order, but it's not without reason. Because then after the record of Babel, we hone in on the seed line of Shem. Now you might wonder then, why do we get two different records of Shem's line? Well, the first one is not a record of Shem's line. 
Chapter 10 is not a genealogy. It is the table of nations. This is a snapshot in time of the socio-political tapestry of the new world. And it was probably as it was known in Shem's line in Abraham's generation. So all these names that we see, we see them because they in some way have contact with Shem or with Shem's line. And it looks like it comes from the time of Abraham. So as we look at all these names, we want to understand this is not a complete list. In fact, we see and we know by necessity that all of these patriarchs had daughters as well who are not recorded. And they may have even had other sons. But it's not scripture's purpose to give us a complete list of all the names. It's God's purpose to tell us of those nations who in some way have affected Shem's line. So in starting with Japheth, then we want to remember Noah's prophecy. Noah had prophesied that God would enlarge Japheth. He would dwell in the tents of Shem, his relationship to the line of Shem, and that Canaan would be his servant. Canaan would be subservient to him or under him. And so we want to start with this patriarch, Japheth. He was immediately the largest of all the sons. Though he was the middle child, he had seven sons, while his brother Ham had four sons and his brother Shem had five sons. Japheth already has the largest record, even at the first generation. His descendants also probably spread over more land than any of the other peoples. The Shemites generally stayed in Asia. The Hamites went south to Africa and also South Asia. Japheth's line, on the other hand, went north and everywhere. He was also immortalized by his progeny. In a similar way to how Abraham is immortalized by the Islamic faith, by the Jewish faith, by the Christian faith, he is held up as this great father of these three religions. So Japheth has been held up by many religions um, around the world. He is the Sanskrit god, Japati. He is the Aryan Indian god, Yapeti. And he is the Greek Titan, Yapetos. Of course, these gods weren't real, but they were real people. They weren't gods. They were just people who lived quite a bit longer than the generations that came after them. When Grandpa Noah is outliving his great, 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 great grandchildren, you might look up at him and say he's some sort of God. When Shem outlives every single generation after him, except for Eber, all the way to Abraham, you might start to look at him as some sort of God, some sort of immortal. And even Eber outlives Abraham. This is where the name Hebrew comes from, because after the Hebrew people began after Abraham, Eber was still the patriarch. Abraham was born, lived a complete life, grew old, and died before Eber even reached his natural death. These patriarchs were probably immortalized as gods, not because they were gods, but because they were losing their god. This is also the origin of ancestor worship. And as they spread out across the world and they forget the God that scattered them, they're going to be looking for other gods. And naturally, they started to worship man. They started to worship the creature rather than the creator. And so did God enlarge Japheth? Yes. God enlarged Japheth over the entire world with many, many descendants and he has immortalized his name in history. So then we turn to some of his sons and we see that some of his sons as well are great men of the earth. Sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog, Madai, 
Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus, seven different sons that are named for us. Yes, we will be going through each one of these. Don't worry, I have maps. Maps make things easy. Gomer's descendants primarily, it seems, went to France. Now, a lot of this information will come from Josephus or Herodotus, some great historians, Bishop Usher, as well as some scriptural evidence that we have. And uh, because this is my background, linguistic evidence as well. Gomer's descendants probably first went to France. These would be the Gauls or the Gala. They also left their name in everywhere over Europe that uses the name Galatia. There are at least two places in the biblical lands called Galatia, as well as in Spain called Galicia. So he went to France. This was Gomer. They also probably went up to the British Isles. Cambria probably gets its name from Gomer and Old Welsh language was called Gomeraga. And so the Scots and the Celts also probably came from Gomer. The Northern Italians, those up in Denmark, which is ancient Cimbri, and Northern Spain, Galicia. So this is where Gomer went. They went over to the northern part of the Iberian Peninsula and then spread across Europe. As well, just about anywhere that France has colonized has Gomorites. That includes Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Now there's going to be one thing that becomes quite apparent. They didn't stay within any borders. As they were spreading out, they're mixing, and they're not mixing just with other Japhethites, they're going to mix with Shemites and they're going to mix with Hamites as well. So it's almost impossible for most people to trace their lineage back to any one patriarch because they probably come from many patriarchs. Gomer also it records for us three of his sons, Ashkenaz, Rifath, and Tagarma. Ashkenaz is the Jewish name for Germany. And the German Jews around the time of the Holocaust were called Ashkenazis because it was believed that they had gone and mixed with the Ashkenaz. This name has left its mark in Armenia as well, and it's also been found in Sweden, Norway, Iceland, Poland, and probably even the Vikings that went to America. Ashkenaz probably took the path above the Black Sea dropping its name in Armenia before heading over to Germany. Rifoth leaves its name at Paphlagonia, which is probably a name you haven't heard because it's a name that I hadn't heard either. It's that northern hump in Turkey, right under the Black Sea. Tagarma left his mark in Turkey, as well as most of those Stan countries, Turkmenistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia, Russia, and even Hungary. He probably took the path under the Caspian Sea, stopping first in Persia before spreading out over Russia and all of the Stan nations. He also went over to Turkey and possibly even into Macedonia. He also had relations with Tyre, which is if you see the Mediterranean Sea, actually, this is probably pretty small. Uh, right up in the top corner of the Mediterranean Sea, this is the land of Tyre. It was a seaport for the Mediterranean. And Beth Tagarma, the sons of Tagarma, gave horses and war horses and mules to Tyre. This was part of their trade. Next, we have the son Magog. Now, Magog is probably. Gog, this is probably his actual name. The Ma at the beginning would mean the land of Gog. So Gog was probably his name, and we'll see that some of these, it records not the name of the ancestor, but the people that came from them or the land that they primarily dwelled in. Gog became the Scythians, the uh, those in Ireland, Scotland, Sweden, Ukraine, Russia, Moldova, Poland, and the Slavs, heading up uh, into uh, Armenia and Georgia, and then spreading out. 
They also probably spread out over Mongolia, mixed with the Tubalites, and became what uh, we know as the Huns. This is a pretty poor rendition from the film Mulan of one of the Huns. But uh, this is an artist rendition that's probably a little more accurate. The Mongolian Empire ruled much of the world at one point. Madai is known elsewhere in scripture as the Medes. These mixed with the Persians. So they would have gone right over into Persia, modern day Iran. And these Medes become quite important as well in scripture. In 2 Kings 17, we see that those who were taken from the northern ten tribes were carried off by Assyria into the cities of the Medes. This was the superpower at that time. As well, the Medes become the first Japhetic line, the first Japhetic kingdom to be a world superpower. Daniel 5.30, we see the same night as Belshazzar saw the writing on the wall. He was the Chaldean king. He was slain. And then Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. The kingdoms that had come before Darius the Mede were all Hamite kingdoms. This was the first world superpower besides Solomon's uh, Jewish superpower. This is the first Japhetic world power. Javan is probably the one that we know the best, but we don't realize we know the best of all of these sons. He didn't go far from Babylon. He went to the Mediterranean Sea. But then from the Mediterranean Sea, he went probably just about everywhere else in the world that there is to go. Javan was the primary sailor among this brothers. Wouldn't have been very hard for him to learn how to build boats and ships. His grandpa had been an excellent shipbuilder and probably would have passed this information on to him. He also had four sons who all seemed to be navigators as well. These sons were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. Kittim and Dodanim probably speak of the people that came from them. So the ancestor's name was uh, probably something like Kit. And for Dodanim, it was probably something like Dodan. Dodan was probably corrupted later into Rodan and became the ancestor that founded the city of Rhodes. Here's the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so they spread out over all the coastlands around the Mediterranean Sea leaving their mark everywhere, even in northern Africa and over into the Strait of Gibraltar. But nothing would have stopped them from going through the Strait of Gibraltar, spreading their descendants once again up into the British Isles, and then either down around Africa and into other locations, which I think they did that as well. But they also may have gone backwards from Babylon, because we see traces of them in the South Asian Sea, and we also see traces of them all the way up into Japan. This is a map from about 1500 AD, and it's said that this map was created off of 2nd century AD Greek maps. The issue for secular cartologists with this map is that it shows the land of Antarctica populated without an ice cap, apparently 300 years before Antarctica was ever discovered. Based off maps from 1800 years before Antarctica was ever discovered. The simple explanation for this is Antarctica wasn't discovered when we think it was discovered, but look at how they handle this. This simple piece of preserved gazelle skin has been the basis of intense controversy in the world of cartography. For one thing, the map appears to show Antarctica almost 300 years before it was discovered. Not only does it show Antarctica, but the continent is drawn as a land mass as it would have appeared before it was covered with its ice cap over 6,000 years ago. The Piri race map had, been, or had to have been based on information older than 4,000 BC. 
This is long before any known sophisticated civilization or any well-defined languages. I call bull on that. It's right in our scriptures. There are well-defined languages. In fact, that's the whole point of chapters 10 and 11, is showing us the well-defined languages. The map intro or introduces, then, the theory of an ancient civilization that had the skills to navigate the world's oceans and accurately chart the lands they visited. Yes, and Genesis 10 shows us the same thing. But their explanations are wild. Professor Hopgood of the University of New Hampshire states that the topographical representation of the area inland from the coast was so accurate that this ancient super civilization had to have aerial capabilities in addition to their nautical and cart cartographical abilities. This naturally led to a theory of an alien civilization or one based in the lost city of Atlantis. We can't possibly believe the Bible is true. It must have been aliens. They also try to suggest that it doesn't show Antarctica, it shows Brazil. But this would propose or uh, make another problem, because then Antarctica would have been attached to Brazil and would have had to float away from Brazil. This was another proposed theory. That Antarctica, an entire continent, just decided to float away from Brazil one day so that we could have the world as it is today. This, to them, is more logical than perhaps we knew of Antarctica a lot longer before we rediscovered it. All of this under the patriarch Javan. Javan probably became who we know as Jupiter. He is the father of the Ionians, his name being corrupted. In Hebrew, he's known as Yawan or Joven, Jove, or Jove Pater, the father Jove. Jove Potter probably turned into Jupiter. The Greeks come from him, the Aeolians and the Rhodes, or the Rhodians, from the son Elisha, whose name became Elis or Hela, leaving the Hellenic races of the Greeks, and also probably lending his names to their idea of the afterlife, the Elysian fields. If you've ever been to France and you've been to the Champs Elysees, this is the Elysian fields in the French language. Let me tell you, it is no paradise on Champs Elysees. It smells like dog poop. Tarshish. Tarshish probably went to Cilicia, also to Carthage. Carthage, as we saw last week, or two weeks ago rather, is a Hamite civilization, but the Japhethites were probably there first. As well, they went over to Spain. So when Jonah decides he doesn't want to go to Nineveh, but instead he gets on the ships of Tarshish, this doesn't necessarily mean he's headed any one place specifically. He's headed west. Tarshish was probably used in a similar manner to how we used the Americas a couple hundred years ago. When someone was headed to the New World, to the Americas, perhaps they were headed to New York Harbor, but they also may have been headed down to Argentina. They may have been headed to, to uh, any other country or city on the coast. But Tarshish uh, left its name in many different cities all over the Mediterranean. Kittim, his name being corrupted into Cyprus and founding the Cyprus island, and the city of Cathissimus. He also probably lends his name to the name Macedonia, being the land of Kittim. These also became the Saxons, the Vandals, the Goths, the Romans, the Gauls, and the Britons, as well as dropping their name in the South Asian Sea in the island of Java, these being the Javanese, and it's also pretty well established that Java's people ended up in Japan. From there, they probably went over to the Americas. And this uh, comes primarily from linguistic evidence. The Japanese language is not Asiatic. Neither is the Korean language. Linguists have no idea where it came from. And I think they just don't dare 
guess where it came from because its closest relative is Hungarian. Sounds strange to us. Naturally, they, they adopted the Chinese writing system, but for a language that's spoken that is not an Asiatic language. It is a European language. Corrupted over years, mixed with the Megagite Huns, who probably came down uh, through Sapporo as the Ainu, and then the Javanese heading up through the Ryukyu, Ryukyu and islands, and becoming what we know today as the Javanese. And you know, this isn't, or the Japanese, this isn't the only contact they had either. They were also probably visited by, visited by Solomon's armies about a thousand years later. Japan has had lots of contact with the biblical world. <clears throat> All of these sons of Java also appear in relation with Tyre in the book of Ezekiel, primarily because of the places they occupied and the things that they did. So in Ezekiel 27.3, it says, Say to Tyre, who dwells at the entrance to the sea, right there on the corner of the Mediterranean, Merchants of the peoples to many coastlands, thus says the Lord God, O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Your brothers are in the heart of the seas. Your builders have perfected your beauty. Of oaks from Bashan, they have made your oars. With ivory, they have inlaid your deck of boxwood from the coastlands of Cyprus. Your sail was of fine embroidered, embroidered linen from Egypt, so that it became your distinguishing mark. Your awning was blue and purple from the coastlands of Elisha. Tarshish was your customer because of the abundance of all kinds of wealth. With silver, iron, tin, lead, they paid for your wares. The ships of Tarshish were the carriers for your merchandise. And you were filled and were very glorious in the heart of the seas. So these Javanese probably became the shipping industry of the ancient world, probably as extensive as our shipping industry today. We also see these in relation to two more of Japheth's sons, Tubal and Meshach. Javan, Tubal, and Meshach, they were your traders. With the lives of men and vessels of bronze, they paid for your merchandise. So we also see that they were already engaged in slave trade way back when. That moves us to the son Tubal. Tubal's descendants became the Caucasian Iberes in the Iberian, or not the Iberian Peninsula, but Iberia of Eastern Europe, the Georgians, the Italics, which were one group that entered into the Italian Peninsula, the uh, north of Georgia, the Tabal region. They also probably went to Mongolia and populated Siberia. Their travels probably looked something like that. Tubal probably leaves his name on the Russian city Tobolsk. His brother, Mishik, they're almost always mentioned together. I almost wonder if they were twins or something because they seem to have travel, traveled as a herd. Meshik left his mark in Cappadocia, in Georgia, and in the Caucasus, as well as northwestern Russia. We can see the corruption of his name from Masak to Mosky to Moska to the Muscovy people, who then settled in Moscow. They also headed north and became the Finns, the Baltics, or Hungary, and even mixed in with the Huns. So Meshach's line probably looked something like this. Last, we come to Tyrus. Tyrus' descendants were the Bulgarians, the Romanians, Serbians, Bosnians, those in Croatia, Turkey, the Etruscans, who were a warring clan with the Italics in Italy, the Thracians of Thrace, and also the Trojans in Troy. So once again, the grandson probably learned how to be a big master builder from his grandpa, who was excellent at building boats, and here now we have the Trojan building horses instead. Tyrus 
probably went in this direction. Now you'll notice something from a lot of these sons of Japheth. Many of them appear again in Ezekiel 38 in one of the last great wars of this civilization. They will come against Israel. Ezekiel says, or uh, records, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Those who went up into the extents of the north, whom God will bring down with a hook in his jaw to wage war against Israel. He will miraculously destroy them, though, but we see that even into the prophetic future, God has a plan for these nations and for these lands. And so that leads us to our last point here. Genesis 10.5. From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated. Into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, and into their nations. Everyone according to their language. We see this must have happened after the events in Babel because they all had one language until the events of Babel. But also notice that all of that that we just looked at from those maps is just summarized very briefly and simply by Moses. From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated. That's all he has to say on the matter. That's the most important point. From Japheth, God spread them out over the coastlands. This is probably the most extensive spreading of any of the sons of Noah. And we don't want to forget that God does have a plan for each one of these nations. Most of them forgot God relatively quickly, started worshiping their own ancestors. Perhaps their ancestors were not doing a wonderful job of teaching them about the God who carried them through the flood. They started worshiping Iapetus, Japheth, and Jupiter, Javan. But in Acts 17, Paul reminds us that God had all of this planned out. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. It was not God's purpose to spread them out so that he would, they would forget him, but to preserve them because they would forget him. But still, if any were to turn to God or to seek after God, the God of their ancestors, not the God who they believed to be their ancestors, God was not far from them. Psalm 86 reminds us there is no one like you among the gods. O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and they shall glorify your name. And how true that is. Though in this civilization, in this present world, the nations do not worship God. Those who have been faithful throughout this civilization, when they enter into the new, their nations will be their inheritance. And as those nations, they will worship the Lord. Zechariah 2 records this from the millennial kingdom, the kingdom civilization. Sing for joy and be glad, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. Many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day and will become my people. Then I will dwell in your midst and you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. God has a plan for the nations, not just in the civilization, but in the world to come as well. And he even has a plan for the nations in the eternal state. After his thousand year reign over this earth, after the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, the nations remain. This is in God's divine and sovereign plan. Revelation 22 records, then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street. 
On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, where the throne of Jesus, which ruled over the earth, will merge with God the Father's, and they will rule for all eternity, Jesus Christ having earned the right. His bondservants also will serve him, that is us. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night. They will not have need of the lamp or of a lamp, of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them. They will reign forever and ever. This is God's plan for the nations and for each individual in the nation. Bear in mind that salvation is an individual gift. It is not a gift given broadly to a nation. No one nation has all of its members saved simply because the nation is a righteous nation. But each person within that nation must take on the righteousness of Christ through faith and through faith alone. And in Galatians 3, Paul reminds us once again, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Now, all of those names that we saw this morning were still in some way in contact with Abraham. In the generation which Abraham gave, or God gave this promise to Abraham that all the nations would be blessed through him, this information was still available to all who were spreading out across the earth. Abraham arrived only about 300 years after, 300 years after Babylon. This information was still widely available. Javan's ships could have carried it to all ends of the earth. Unfortunately, we saw that just as Israel, without the direct intervention of God, nations have this bent towards abandoning God, this bent towards the sin nature, this bent towards blasphemy and self-worship. And that became the course of history. God knew that and God provided a plan of salvation that even in this dispensation, in this age, he has planned for the entire earth to hear this message, not of a promise to come, but of a completed gift, Jesus Christ's blood shed for us on the cross so that all who believe will enter into eternity and will rule together with Christ in their own nation. And so our takeaway this morning, God has prepared the nations for his eternal purposes. He has provided salvation for the whole world, and faith alone guarantees participation among those redeemed nations. Let us pray.